That's the third movement of Mahler's 10th symphony. You heard the uh, version there, a new version on Atma Record labeled by Yannick Nézé-Séguin and the Orchestre Metropolitaine. And that is the work that is being performed tonight and tomorrow by the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra to wrap up their Mahler Fest. Part of their Mahler Fest is they invited the uh, Mahler scholar, uh, Norman Lebrecht, in town to introduce the concerts. He gave a, a, a uh, he gave a talk last night at the concert hall, and he will do so tonight and tomorrow night as part of the uh, series Mahler Fest. Uh, Norman Lebrecht is a uh, He's been around for a while. He has been in the music scene. He is a music critic. He is an author. He's written two books on Mahler. He's written two, uh, Mahler Remembered and Why Mahler, are just two of his many books he has written. He has his own website, too, called slippeddisc.com, which uh, keeps people up to date on a daily basis, many postings about things happening in the classical world. And uh, we're going to get really up to date with him now because he's in the studio live this morning. Uh, first time in Winnipeg. Welcome to Classic 107 and Winnipeg. Good morning. Good morning, Winnipeg. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, we're going to talk lots about Mahler this morning. But before I talk about Mahler, because I know that you've spent a lot of hours talking about Mahler, maybe I'll give you a few minutes of a break. <laughs> I want to talk about you for a minute because okay. I want to uh, give uh, an idea of, uh, to our listeners who is Norman Lebrecht? And let me tell tell me about your background in the music world. I, I I suppose I came into music quite late. I spent my 20s in television news. I was chasing wars and revolutions and earthquakes and pandas being born at the zoo. And it wasn't exciting uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I got out before my 30th birthday because I wanted to get back to being a writer. And, and one of the things that preoccupied me were the, the big questions in music. Why does this piece of music affect me and that one doesn't? Why does, it, why does this phrase affect me in a certain way? Why does it affect, affect me like this with one performer and like that? as another performer. The mechanics of music fascinated me, and nobody was actually asking these questions or providing me with answers. And so I started writing about music from a, a news, a current affairs perspective, um, and putting it on the front page of newspapers and doing things that really weren't done. And then mm -hmm. out of that, I started writing books and doing a lot of broadcasting. And um, Do you have a background in music? In terms of, I, are you a music lover, passionate I, about I played, music? I played Piano and violin as a kid, mm -hmm. but I have really poor left hand, left right coordination. Do, I don't drive. The reason I don't drive is I would never go the right way. <laughs> so uh, knowing that uh, and and hearing very early on, because I had perfect pitch as a kid, um, hearing that what I was doing wasn't very good and other people did it much better. Mm -hmm. I thought I, I'm, I'm in a better capacity standing out on the outside and looking in and trying to communicate it to other people, trying to explain what it is that excites me so much about music. Well, I can and the great the, mysteries, yeah. really the great mysteries. I can understand that. That's, that's where I come from. Why I'm not a musician. Mm -hmm. I am a music lover, passionate about music, mm -hmm. and I've spent my life dedicated to music as well. So you listen to classical music. When did you first experience Mahler, and when did you become hooked on Mahler? I read about Mahler before I knew about him, and mm -hmm. before I heard a note of his music. Uh, we're going back to the early 70s. It wasn't done very much. And I picked up at a public library Alma Mahler's um, memoir of her husband, mm -hmm. and it, it, it both entranced and infuriated me because clearly she is absorbed by his personality. She loves him and she hates him. And I thought a man who could arouse that much passion, both positive and negative, and the person that he's married to has got to be an interesting musician. So I started delving into it. And then really the question that's occupied me for half of my life and that, that I finally got around to writing about in the book, why Mahler? Uh, what we're dealing with is, is a phenomenon that's unique in the history of music. There has never been a composer who was derided in his lifetime, rejected for half a century afterwards, and then returned to displace Beethoven at the center of the conversation. So why Mahler? What is it that Mahler does to us that other composers don't? We used to have an advertisement in England for, for a beer where a, a German scientist would come onto the screen and say, Heineken is the beer that reaches. Heineken reaches parts other beers don't reach, uh, <laughs> and you know, I would substi I'd substitute Mahler for that. Mahler mm -hmm. actually reaches parts of us that other composers don't seem to get close to. He unsettles us. Why does he do that? What is it in the music? What does the man invest in the music in order to do that to us? Now, what does he do to you? Everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. The whole gamut of emotions. Mm -hmm. um, he, um, you know, he can upset me when I'm happy, and he can, and he can um, 
put a little smile on my face when I'm sad. It, it, he, he, he disturbs you. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't let you be complacent. He asks you really, really difficult questions. He makes you look at the things that you don't want to look at. And I, I've had a, a question, I, a question the other day from um, actually a tabloid editor in Germany, mm -hmm. um, you know, like the Sun, uh, who 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 said he was going to have to talk to the National Youth Orchestra about Mahler, and he'd read my books, and what could he actually say to the kids that meant something to them? And, and the only metaphor I could give was that I'd fallen over the previous day, running up the wrong escalator in the subway. And I hurt my leg, and I got to the top and, and thought, OK, just get into a cab, go home, sit down. Went home, sat down, made a cup of tea. Um, I was alone in the house, went back to my office to work, didn't at any point, knew that I'd done some damage to my leg, didn't look at, at the leg until I was ready to go to bed that night. And I thought, why am I not looking at the leg? If I was Mahler, I would not only look at the leg, but I would draw conclusions from it. I would be asking myself questions mm -hmm. about what had I just done to myself and what meaning did that have to my life? So Mahler forces you to look from the things that you would normally look away from, whether it's a bloodied leg or the nature of your relationships mm -hmm. with your partner, with your children. Um, He's with very much a philosopher. He is a mm -hmm. philosopher mm -hmm. of human relations. Mm -hmm. And it's all there in the music. You don't have to know it. You don't have to know it. You just have to sit there and experience it. And then it, you become a more sensate human being. Um, it may disrupt your relationships. We ought to put a, we really, we ought to put a health warning on my <laughs> symphonies. <laughs> do, do not go here if you want to be secure in your relationships. <laughs> I'm in the studio chatting with Norman Lebrecht. He is a Mahler expert. He's an author. He's a music critic. He's been involved in the music industry for a long, long time, different capacities. And he's in town with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra to uh, chat about Mahler tonight. He'll introduce the uh, concerts uh, tonight and tomorrow night, Mahler's 10th Symphony. The one thing I think a lot of people don't know, we think of Mahler as a composer. He's really, I mean, he spent most of his life and probably when he was alive was more famous as a conductor than a composer, which... Well, he was one of the two or three most important conductors of his time. Mm -hmm. uh, the others were Arthur Nikisch, who conducted Boston and Berlin, and Arturo Toscanini, who took much of what he did from Mahler, because Mahler had already established the conductor as the central personality in the Opera House in 1897 when Toscanini became chief conductor at La Scala. So Toscanini modeled his authority on Mahler's. So he's a tremendously formative figure in the history of conducting. Uh, one of the ways that I approached Mahler was in my book, The Maestro Myth, which is the history of conducting, to look at how he changed the philosophy of conducting, not only in terms of, of what a conductor does, but what, what, a, what a conductor has the right to do. Because Mahler, in his own symphonies, as a composer, would say to conductors, look, if it doesn't work, I put the notes on the page, if it doesn't work, in the circumstances in which you're performing the symphony, if it's acoustically wrong, if the atmosphere is wrong, if the musicians don't get it, change it. Mm -hmm. You have the right, you have the duty, he told Otto Klemperer, you have the duty to change what I've written in order to make it work. Now that's, uh, you know, if you're a playwright, uh, do you do that with a bunch of actors? No. Mm -hmm. But that is Mahler's vision. Make it work. We're all searching for the same thing. We're all searching for these answers. Let's try and find a way of getting there, which for me is just a tremendously attractive approach mm -hmm. to art. So much of what we do in the music world is constrained by rigidities and lines and rules and things that we no longer know the meaning of. And Mahler comes along and says, forget the rules, make it work. Mm -hmm. I love that. So why Mahler? There, there are many answers yeah. to that question, but that's one of them. Mm -hmm. So we're, you're in town specifically to talk about one symphony of Mahler that you'll be introducing mm. tonight. I know last night was probably an expanded talk, um, but they're performing the final, uh, final symphony of Mahler tonight, Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra is. Now, some of our listeners are very well versed in classical music. Others probably, you know, are new to it and don't necessarily have the background. What I'd like you to do right now, if I may ask you, is to give our listeners a reason why they should check out the symphony tonight, Mahler's 10th symphony, a little bit about the symphony and why they can get excited about it. Well, 
Firstly, you've never heard it before in Winnipeg. You've never heard it before in Manitoba. I mean, this is your first chance to hear the full Mahler 10th. Mahler died um, while the symphony was... He left the symphony at uh, at the end of the summer of 1910, complete but in sketch form. He hadn't filled it out. He hadn't Mm -hmm. fleshed it out. And he would have made revisions had he come back to it the following summer. Unfortunately, in February 1911, endocarditis struck, and he was dead three months later. So... For a long time, it was considered an unfinished symphony, unperformable. For the past 50 years, it has been performable, and it's finally reached Winnipeg, and I'm so excited the Winnipeg Symphony are going to be doing it. It's written in... This is a man actually exposing his deepest agony to us. It's not so much his dying agony, but the agony of what's going on around him. He has a much younger wife. While he's writing the symphony, she's having an affair. Mm -hmm. He's having to deal with that affair and with its consequences for him, for her, for their marriage, for the man that she is sleeping with, Walter Gropius, the architect, for their child, for his future, and all of this, he's got to finish a symphony on deadline. Mm -hmm. So what we're listening to is one of those rare anatomies of a marriage, of a drama, and of somebody who is absolutely unflinching in trying to force himself to look at what's going wrong. Not, not so much the gashed leg, but the deep gash in his heart. At the end of it, he goes and talks to Sigmund Freud. They spend four and a half hours walking beside a canal in Leiden in Holland. It's the longest consultation Freud ever gave. It changed <laughs> Mahler. It changed Freud. Mm-hmm. Both of them were transformed. Freud said um, nobody had ever understood him so instantly and intuitively, as Mahler had done that day. The only reason the conversation ended was that Mahler looked at his watch and said to Freud, the last tram's leaving in five minutes. <laughs> you imagine Freud, beard of lighting, running to catch the tram. <laughs> um, so all of that, all of that drama is there in Mahler's 10th symphony. How can you stay at home tonight and tomorrow and not come down to Symphony Hall in Winnipeg to listen to it? Um, I'm I don't know about tonight, but tomorrow night there's going to be a lot of kids banging on your door. The one place you can escape from <laughs> Halloween is come and listen to Marla 10, and you will be spooked. It is a, it's a disturbing symphony. Um, it's very disturbing for the musicians. Uh, I spoke to some of them last night, and they're really troubled by it. They can't. It's shaking them up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not just shaking them up physically, what they do with their hands, what they do with their mouths, but it's shaking them up in their perspectives of themselves and their lives. Uh, it makes you ask painful questions. So if you're up for that, and we should all be up for that, possibly not every day of our lives, but mm-hmm. a lot of them, if you're up for that, come down and hear the symphony tonight. It's Mahler's 10th symphony. It's five movements, and it takes you across the whole gamut of emotions it actually takes you to the point of musical disintegration there is one 11 note chord that Mahler puts in the symphony which obviously can't be sustained it's toppling over under its own weight (laughs) and you think this must be the end of the world and it isn't because the genius of Mahler is that he always finds resolution he always enables you just when you think there can be no way out to find a way out well, I couldn't have said it any better myself. I'm glad I asked you that question. You should be, sales and marketing is his next job, I think. And, and it's, it's a little bit early, and I've got to say, it's a bit early in the morning to be well, talking about Mahler's 10th Symphony. Oh, yeah. I can't tell at all. It doesn't feel too early to me. I've been up for hours already. It's my afternoon. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it is going to be an event uh, tonight and tomorrow night with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, and you'll have a chance to hear Norman and chat more about it uh, before the concert. So if you're going to go, uh, you want to make sure you get there on time to... Uh, to catch the introduction. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. It's a pleasure. I wish we could, you know, we could probably chat for another hour and... Um, Should we do that? Oh, we... Uh, uh, you never know. <laughs> just, uh, put the music on. Yeah, oh, yeah. Come on, let's carry on talking. <laughs> We're going to... Uh, I've got time now to play you uh, a, a little bit of Mahler right now before we reach the top of the hour. And I've, we've, I asked Norman... Uh, which piece he would like to hear. I don't have time to play uh, any more movements from the 10th Symphony. You're going to have to go to the symphony to see it tonight and tomorrow night. And uh, WSO.ca is the place for information and tickets. So 
This is the piece he chose. Tell us a quick a little bit about this. This is Mahler's signature song. It's called Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. It means I'm lost to the world. He writes it to his girlfriend. She's half his age. He's 41, she's 22, and he wants her to marry him. And he's already sent her the love letter, and she's pretty much inclined that way. And he writes this song which says, I'm lost to the world. You can't touch me. I'm totally, totally, totally in love with you, but only up to a point. And actually, that tells one of the very, very basic truths about life and love. We do commit. We do commit to another person. But there's always something of ourselves that we hold back. There is a place where we can't be reached. Ich bin der Welt abhandeln gekommen. Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau and Karl Böhm conducting. <laughs> 